it preaches to us, you knew eventually that Pastor Rich, I am into fashion. I wasn't going to keep wearing those disposable masks forever. I was just waiting until I saw the perfect fashion mask that just spoke to my heart. And guys, I found it. And you are going to see me wearing it next Sunday. But for now, you're going to see me on the video because you either attended this morning or got up to watch the live stream. And I think everyone will agree this is the perfect mask for Pastor Rich and, uh, and anyone walking with Jesus Christ. But Life Path, I love you. I miss you. And I'll see you next Sunday. Yeah, don't you feel bad for the extroverts? This has just been a tough time for the extroverts. The introverts were like, is there a quarantine? And the extroverts are all dying. And I know that Pastor Rich is watching right now. We do miss you, buddy. We're glad you're feeling some better. You look like you're feeling better. And we look forward to seeing you next week. So let me just say a quick prayer for him and for one other person that I know is sick. Lord, um, we do pray for Pastor Rich that you would give him healing from the shingles. And Lord, just remove those painful sores and help him to get back to doing what he loves to do, which is um, being a pastor and taking care of people and loving people. Also want to lift up to uh, uh, Chalo Gomez or Lopez and his family, that his wife, his adult son were both taken to the hospital with covid They've all been exposed, and so prayers that his uh, wife and son would get better and prayers that Chalo would, um, would not get sick. And, Lord, we pray for everybody that's sick right now, and, Lord, we, we just pray for an end to this virus um, that you would um, give us healing that we so desperately need. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we are uh, separated, and sometimes we had actually a pretty good number of people at the first service, but obviously our numbers are a lot lower, and sometimes that can get a little discouraging. But our, our, um, one of our worship leaders, Molly Melillo, did some research, looked at all the information on our Facebook uh, feed and our YouTube feed, and then drew, she hand-drew this little graph, and you can see that uh, the average engagement for watching our, our live streams is actually about 435 views um, every Sunday. So um, we say that knowing that the gospel is going out into the world and also as an encouragement to do what Pastor Rich just said, which is to share the live feed on your, on your social media so that you can encourage people to connect with the Word of God and with God's family. So all of that is good. Let's see. I think that was all I was going to do before uh, praying. But Lord, we do pray for your Holy Spirit to be with us today as we worship you. We pray that you would preach to us, that you would speak to us, that you would protect us and watch over us. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So let me start off with a question. Do you... Hi, Felix. How are you? You doing all right? All right, got your mask on, ready to go. Very good, man. Uh, let me start off with a question. Do you know what situational awareness is? Have you heard that term before? Okay, you have. Um, what situational awareness is, is being aware of your surroundings in light of possible threats. Um, for instance, if you walk into a coffee shop, do you... Just kind of check out who's in there and see if anybody looks a little bit threatening. When you go into a new public space, is the first thing you do to look for the exits. Um, or when everybody else has got both eyes on their phones, do you have one eye up and are checking out what's going on around you? If so, that is situational awareness. We try to teach, especially our daughters, situational awareness. I've got three daughters. You know, you go into a dark parking lot. Don't be on your phone. Have your head up, your eyes open. Just be aware of what's going on around you because that will help to keep you safe. Well, you may be wondering to yourself, why are you talking about situational awareness? Well, 
because we're reading our last passage from 1 Peter this morning. We've gone through the entire book of 1 Peter, but in this passage, he talks about something that could be described as spiritual, situational awareness. It's kind of a mouthful. So let's look at chapter 5 of 1 Peter, beginning in verse 8. Listen now to the word of God. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kinds of suffering. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. All right, it has been said that Christians can be put into two categories. Those who think about the devil too much and those who think about the devil too little. We, would you do me a favor, Ileana, and shut that door back there because I'm hearing voices out there. Um, so there are some people and sometimes in some places who, uh, you know, they just, the expression is they see a demon under every bush. Right? Every situation is an encounter with the evil one. Life is full of drama. They're full of drama. Uh, They probably focus on the devil too much. But for most of us, we probably don't think about him very much at all. Right? Because when I say the word Satan, what pops up into your head? Is it a picture that looks a little bit like that? Right? You know, you think of... uh, A guy with uh, horns and a little forked tail, a little pitchfork, a little red suit. It's awfully hard to take that seriously. But Peter says that if we don't, if we're not aware, if we don't have some spiritual, situational awareness of Satan, it's like walking into a dark parking lot and, and being on our phone. The first verse of our passage said, Be alert and of sober mind, your enemy. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, if you knew that every time you walked into a dark parking lot, there was the potential to encounter a hungry lion that wanted to eat you, how would that change how you walked through dark parking lots? Probably quite a bit. So he says we need to be alert, we need to watch out. How do we do that? What does spiritual, situational awareness look like? Well, let's think about the danger. Who or what is Satan? Uh, We don't have time for a full treatment of that subject, but the short, simple explanation is that when God created his universe, God created more than one kind of intelligent being. That some beings are physical as well as spiritual, namely we human beings. But there's another kind of intelligent creature that's just spirit, no physical body, at least no physical body that we understand. And we usually refer to those intelligent spiritual beings as angels. But angel is not really what they are. Angels just a a description of one of the jobs that some of them do, because angel just means messenger. And some of these spiritual creatures have different jobs, and they go by different names in the Bible, uh, dominions and powers and authorities and rulers. There's this this, um, connotation that what God has done when he's created these spiritual creatures is he's sort of delegated to them areas of responsibility over aspects of the creation. And just as human beings have rebelled against God and taken the authority that God gives to us and said, hey, we're not going to serve you, we're going to do our own thing, so also many of these purely spiritual beings, these so-called angels, also have rebelled against God. 
And we don't, the Bible doesn't really talk too much about the history of all that. Apparently we don't really need to know it. But Jesus does refer to what he says, he calls them the devil and his angels. So there's obviously more than one. They obviously used to be something good, and now they're not. And they are under the leadership of this one particular dark spirit that usually goes by one of two names, the devil or Satan. But neither one of those are actually names. They're actually sort of descriptions of him, because devil just means the one who slanders, meaning the one who tells lies about you in order to hurt you. And Satan, we think of that as being a name, but really it's sort of a description. And it's not Satan, it's actually in the Bible, it's the Satan. And it just means the adversary or the enemy. And this being, the devil, Satan, is powerful enough to where Jesus describes him as the ruler of this world. That's kind of alarming. And Paul calls him, even more alarmingly, he refers to him as the God of this age. God, little g. But that's still pretty scary. And, you know, if this, or maybe it just seems far-fetched. Right, this talk of you know dark spiritual beings that have authority and then have rebelled against God. And if that seems far fetched to you, then just consider what does the world look like? You know, you, you start to think about all of the darkness, the, the genocides, the the child pornography, all of the ways in which people are treated as things to be used, and the level of evil seems superhuman sometimes. I mean, you look at the world, does the God of this age always seem like a very kind being? And so when Jesus enters into the scene, the the New Testament often describes what Jesus does as almost a military operation. That he is this invading force who's come into the darkness of this world in order to, to defeat the powers of darkness and restore God's creation to the rule and reign of God. John chapter, which is it? Three. Says the reason that the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. That's military language, isn't it? And if you look at the ministry of Jesus, it often looks like an encounter with a hostile force. Now you can, of course, think of the exorcisms that happen with some regularity in uh, the gospel stories, but you know, some of the healings uh, where Jesus rebukes the illness, um, it really makes it look like behind the, the sickness, the illness that the person has, is this, this evil spirit that's causing the pain. Or, you know, the, when Jesus is on the boat with his disciples and the storm comes up and the, the, they're about to drown and Jesus gets up and when he speaks to the storm, he talks to it as if there's an evil spirit behind the weather itself trying to kill them. Now, if you've lived on the Gulf Coast for any length of time and been through a hurricane, you get that, right? Because that wind starts to howl and it does sound a little demonic. But the point is, Whenever Jesus does anything in the scriptures, very frequently it looks like an encounter with the forces of evil. And then the big showdown between Jesus and the forces of evil takes place in a way that nobody expects. He goes to the cross. And the New Testament, a lot of the language in the New Testament, portrays what happens at the cross as the defeat and actually the disarming, the taking away of the weapons of the forces of evil. For instance, Colossians 2.15 says, having disarmed the powers and authorities, and he means those spiritual beings, the powers and authorities, he made a public, public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross. And if you're like, well, how does the cross disarm the evil spirits 
Well, the logic is actually pretty simple. Because the evil spirits have rebelled against God, and what they do is they, they seduce us into joining them in their rebellion, so that human beings are in rebellion. And that's a weapon against God, because we human beings were also supposed to have authority and power over God's creation, and now we're fighting against him. So we're a weapon against God, but our rebellion itself, our sin, becomes a weapon against us, because it imprisons us under the authority of the powers of darkness. And so when Jesus goes to the cross, what he does is he gives his life for us, in place of us, so that we can be forgiven. And when we are forgiven, it takes away the devil's authority over us, taking that weapon out of his hand, and then it takes us out of his hands so that we're no longer a weapon against God. So the cross disarms the powers and the principalities. The whole passage goes like this. You were spiritually dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature, because you had rebelled against God, you see. And it was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with the Messiah, for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us, and he took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. And the Bible also talks about as he takes us out of this realm of darkness, what he's doing is he's rescuing us. As Ephesians says, oh, no, it's Colossians. For God rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son. So what I'm trying to get you to see is that so much of the language of the New Testament, as it talks about what Jesus has done, as it talks about what he has accomplished, so much of it is military language, defeating the powers of darkness and moving us from the darkness and into the light. And uh, that is what we mean by the term redemption. Now, we often use the term redemptionist to sort of, I don't know, just kind of make good on a, a bad situation. He redeemed himself in some way. You know, he, he, he did the right thing. But redemption, actually, to redeem someone literally means to buy them out of slavery. It's to pay the price to get someone to set them free. And when we sinned, we became slaves to our own bad behavior and slaves to the darkness and to the dark powers, to the dark spiritual authorities. And Jesus, by dying, gives his life for our life, and that is the purchase of our freedom so that we are redeemed, you see. And all of that is to say that what Jesus is doing when he dies and all the other things that he does, it's about setting us free from these dark powers. But Peter's point is that even though the decisive battle against the evil forces has been fought and won, the war has been decided, but the war is not yet over. That the darkness is still around. And you can think, I mean, I guess the analogy, and it's a pretty common analogy, and I've probably used it before, if you think about, I don't know, World War II, and there were some big de uh, uh, decisive battles that really turned the, the, the direction of the war. There was the D-Day invasion of the, the Allied, you know, Allies invading uh, France and defeating the Germans. And then on the Eastern Front, I guess maybe Stalingrad, where the, the Russians halted the Germans and, and began to defeat them. And those decisive battles happened in, I don't know, 1943 and 1944, but the war still went on for another year, year and a half. I mean, the thing was decided, but people were still dying. And that's Peter's point. The, the, the battle at the cross has decided how this is all going to go, but the line is still out there. The forces of darkness are still out there, and they can still hurt you. The lion can still eat you. So you need to be aware, practice some spiritual awareness, some situational awareness, and he says, resist him. It's a fight. It's our job to fight. We say, well, how do, you, how do you fight the unseen forces of darkness? What does that look like? 
It doesn't look like it looks in the movies. Um, well, in order to understand how to resist him, we have to understand how he attacks. And Peter doesn't talk about it in detail in our passage, but if you go back and you look through the whole letter, which we've done because we've been looking through the, the letter of 1 Peter since, I don't know, April? He talks about two different ways in which the, the devil attacks us. And really, they're kind of connected to the two different names that we use for him. Um, the devil and Satan. The devil means the one who lies in order to hurt you. And one of the ways that the devil attacks us is by whispering in our ear lies that we need to go back to live the way that we used to live. Back when we belonged to him. You need to go back to that. And Peter says that in another place. He says, you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. So when you hear that voice saying, you know, just all trying to be obedient to God and following and doing the right thing, that's all a big waste of time. You need to go back to what you used to do. You, now you know whose voice that is. You need to be aware of it. And here's the thing. The devil does not play fair. I mean, you think about it. Whenever you're, you're fighting someone, right? we got some martial artists there in the back row. And when you're fighting someone, you look for where their weakness is and you attack them where they're weakest. Well, the devil does the same thing with us. And we could talk about different ways, but I'll just mention one. The devil will hit you most when you are tired and when you are stressed. Right? When you're tired and your resources are low, that's when you're going to be tempted to go back and do things the way you used to do them. When you're tired... He's going to encourage you to go back to the addictions that you used to use to deal with your fatigue. When you're stressed, that's when he's going to tell you you've got to handle this the way you've always, with your anger and whatever. The devil will come at you. You think about when you're tired, when you're stressed, be aware of the situation. Think tired and stressed is sort of the spiritual equivalent to walking through the dark parking lot. And if you see the lion coming, it's, it's when, you can, when you can see him coming, you, you've already won the battle. It's when he hits you from behind when you're not aware, and all of a sudden you've lost your temper, or all of a sudden you're doing the, the self-destructive thing, whatever it looks like. Um, so be aware when you're tired, when you're stressed, that's the time to look for the line. You see him coming, you know what to do. You resist. You say to him, you know what? I am not going to do things the way that I used to do them. I am no longer a child of darkness. Now I am a child of God and I will walk in the light. Right? So that's way number one that he attacks us. Way number two, if way number one is connected to his, his name, the devil, the one who lies, way number two is connected to the concept of the Satan, the adversary, the enemy. Because we, as we've read through 1 Peter, what we've seen is he's writing to people who are being persecuted. People are, who are being treated cruelly because they are Christians. And what Peter's point is, is that behind the human persecution, the human bad treatment, is the work of the evil one himself. And Paul says that when people are doing bad things, it's the, it's the spirit of the devil that's behind it. He says this. He says, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. And so when we hear about schoolgirls in Nigeria who are kidnapped and enslaved because they're Christians. Or we hear about pastors in China who are literally bulldozed under with their church buildings. Or we hear about converts in Iran or Saudi Arabia who are beheaded because they become Christians. Or we hear about Christians in North Korea who are placed in re-education camps. 
we know that behind the human evil is the work of the Satan, the dark enemy of our souls. Now, we don't face that level of malicious, demonic attack in this place. But you know what? There's a kind of soft persecution that goes on in our culture. Because we are constantly fed this message that our faith is a big, empty waste of time. From our entertainment I industry, from uh, our academies, from um, just the elite forces that kind of control our culture, we are fed a constant diet that life is really meaningless, that we are nothing but animals, and that this business about a God who loves us and who has sent his son to rescue us is just not true. Now, I know a person who faces this kind of talk right within her own family, and she's constantly told by her own family that she is worth, worthless, that she has never done anything and she never will do anything. And she is constantly being verbally abused. And what I have tried to tell her is that when she hears those ugly, hateful voices, that is not the voice of God. That is not the voice of the Holy Spirit. That is the voice of our enemy. And when we hear those voices saying, we are worthless, life is meaningless, then we need to remember to stand firm in our faith and say back to that voice, that is not true. I am worth dying for because my Lord and my Savior has died for me. And life is worth living. Sometimes it's hard, but life is worth living because I have purpose and I have meaning and I am called to be God's child. So when we hear, because sometimes those those Perse those chains of persecution are physical change, but sometimes those chains of persecution and hate are emotional and spiritual chains. But he has redeemed us and set us free, you see. We are no longer slaves. So that's, thing to remember. that's one thing to remember, that when we see the persecution, when the hate comes to us, to remember who we are. But there's another thing that we can do to fight against the devil. And you know what that is? When we're hated... We don't hate back. Right? Because one of the one of the one of the the things that we're told in the New Testament is that the person that's attacking us isn't actually our real enemy. Paul writes it this way: He says, We are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against the evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against the mighty powers in this dark world, against the evil spirits in the heavenly places. That the person who's attacking us is not our enemy. Instead, they are a prisoner of our enemy. And so Peter tells us how to spiritually fight back. Here's what Peter says in chapter 3 of his first letter. He says, finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, Love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with e uh, insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. You see, if we return an insult, I mean, I know that's what we naturally want to do. Somebody insults us, we want to insult them right back. Somebody hits us, we want to hit them right back, whether it's metaphorically or physically. We want to strike back. But when you strike back and you insult or you strike that blow, are you hurting the devil? How's he going to respond? He's not the one you're hitting. He's going to be happy. Because it's in that moment... When we strike back that we're defeated. This is why it says in Romans, it says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil by doing good. Well, how are you overcome by evil? It's not when somebody insults you or somebody hurts you or even when somebody kills you that you are overcome by evil. You're overcome by evil by doing evil yourself. By insulting. By harming the other person. 
Because in that moment, we're not acting like children of the Most High God who gave His Son out of love for us. We're acting like the devil himself. And so when we do the evil thing, we're just making the devil happy. We're just giving in to our enemy. So when you are being threatened, when you're being insulted, remember who the true enemy is, because if you're able to respond to an insult with a blessing, if you're able to re respond to, with cruelty, with a, with a kindness of some kind, with forgiveness, with love, then you may actually be the means by which God sets somebody else free from our enemy. So remember, practice spiritual, situational alertness. Our enemy is out there like a lion, but you know what? We don't have to be afraid because he has already been beaten. His time is short. Remember who you are. Resist him, and he will flee. Amen. Lord, we thank you that you did not abandon us to the powers of darkness, even when we join the powers of darkness, even when we occasionally still do dark things. You have sent your Son to set us free, to redeem us out of slavery. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to be aware when we're tired, when we're stressed, that we're walking through that dark parking lot and to be looking for that lion. To be aware when we are being insulted, being threatened in some way, that that is the work of the enemy, and to remember not to respond with hatred. Lord, you have called us to be victorious, to share in the victory of your son Jesus, and we thank you for that. We thank you for all that you do for us, and we just want to remember that you are far more powerful than the lion. And so we don't need to be alert, but don't be afraid. And now we have one of our families who's going to lead us in the Lord's Prayer, Kathy and Benny Trejo, and they are going to say the Lord's Prayer in Spanish. They're going to say the Lord's Prayer in English, and we invite you to, to join, uh, whether you are at home or whether you are here. Go ahead. Padre nuestro que estás en los cielos, santificado sea tu nombre. Venga tu reino. Hágase tu voluntad como en el cielo, así también en la tierra. El pan nuestro de cada día, danoslo hoy. Y perdona, perdónanos nuestras deudas como también nosotros perdonamos a nuestros deudores. Y no nos metas en tentación, mas líbranos del mal, porque tuyo es el reino y el poder y la gloria por todos los siglos. Amén. Amén. Our Father, who art, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will, will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily, our daily bread, bread, and forgive us our trespasses, our trespasses as, as we forgive forgets. those who trespass against us. And, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine, thine is the kingdom, kingdom and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. It's been a while since I have heard the Lord's Prayer in Spanish.